Council. Uh, members may have seen the news that former Councillor and Council Chairman Alan Wyatt, MBE, died on Saturday, Sunday, the 7th of July, at the age of 92. We shall therefore stand for a moment to respect for him and also to reflect and remind ourselves of who we serve and why we are here. Thank you. 
I think only, that's my recollection, only four of them were going to be affordable units, four of them were going to be penthouse uh, suites. I felt at the time it was an inappropriate use of combined authority money. Um, I think that many of us object to what's in the NPPF that allows commercial premises, particularly offices, to be turned into housing. Uh, the officers were at pains to say that actually, in fact, the local member, um, Councillor Anna Bailey, was at pains to say that actually, even though this office was in the centre of Ely, uh, it had good access to play space for children and doctor surgeries and so on. Um, I personally have great concerns about offices being turned into uh, living accommodation because we can do it through uh, without any planning permission and therefore uh, proper parking, proper access to health, education, play space and so on uh, is much less of a consideration that would be if a proper planning application for it. So I shall continue to object to similar applications for funding to the combined authority when I feel it's for housing that is not does not go through a proper planning process. Thank you, Peter. Before we get to questions, does Councillor Chamberlain or Councillor Haynes wish to speak as part of the overview and scrutiny committee? Councillor Chamberlain. Thank you, Chairman. If I may, um, I just draw Councillor's attention to the note on page 35, which, which regards the discussion in the committee about a light touch approach to scrutiny of the authority. I believe that the light touch serves neither the, the authority itself. <laughs> For our members as well, uh, and we can say, of course, something that I have a pay attention to do with it. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Higgins, do you wish to add to that? No, I know we fully support that position. Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Tony Mason, as a representative of the Audits and Governance Committee, do you wish to say anything, Councillor Mason? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, we come to questions then. Thank you, Chair. So, it was simply to report that I attended uh, as a substitute for Councillor Chamberlain the uh, second meeting of the scrutiny committee in this cycle, um, along with the Councillor Fane, who was standing as a bit. And one of the things that was clear was that the scrutiny committee had a lot of new people on, and so inevitably there will be some sort of catching up to do as people can't speak. But one of the things that we decided, and I'm assuming that this council is supportive, was that some of the things that the combined authority does or intends to do are very much in the long term. And so the scrutiny committee decided amongst itself that we should focus on things that perhaps were in the next 24 or 36 months. Um, as a means of keeping track of progress. And, uh, and in that spirit, I signed the Councillor Chamberlain up for the bus review. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Toffey. Um, um, Councillor Hatchett. Thank you, Neil. I have a question about the uh, scrutiny committee of the 31st of May. I'm looking at page 33. Uh, I'm looking at the um, paragraph. Where it says the mayor stated that he supported the principle of planned application for an agri tech site in Cambridge as it would serve the rural part in Maryland. I just wonder uh, if those presents uh, were advised on what authority the mayor actually said this uh, opinion of his to the uh, appeal chair. Um, Chairs, I, I did ask the man uh, on what basis he had done that. He said he had opposed it on a personal basis. That wasn't at that time according to the minutes. I did ever ask for it to be corrected at the subsequent meeting when the minutes were agreed. Thank you. You mean that he did not do so in his official capacity? Thank you. So I, so I made uh, a lot of formal complaint with the Divine Authority about the uh, mayor's intervention in the, uh, the appeal. Um, the assurance I had was that he had written in his capacity as mayor, uh, and I saw a copy of the letter, but he had not written in his capacity as the, uh, the, the head of the combined authority. 
So we have to make a the authority, no paper, he's written on no paper uh, with his own address, but he had signed himself as mayor. So it was in that, in that capacity. I felt it was completely, utterly inappropriate, and uh, my displeasure and that of any members has been well made known. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I think it's also uh, relevant to mention that he did, do, he did not speak um, with the authority of the uh, rural farming area because I said he wasn't consulted about it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on these reports? Thank you. We note that the reports and the comments will be noted in the groups of the party. Item 9, membership of committees and outside bodies, page 2 of your agenda. Members are asked to note the enormous changes in membership of committees and agree any changes to membership of outside bodies. We will see from the agenda that Councillor Graham Cohn has now replaced Councillor Lee Poppy as a member of the Security and Overview Committee, and that Councillor Philip Allen has replaced Councillor Alex Mannion as a substitute. Councillor Eileen Wilson has replaced Councillor Dr. Liam Solomon as a member of the Cambridge Fringes Joint Development Control Committee. You are also asked to note the clarification in your agenda that the Council has only permitted two substitutes per political group on the Fringes JDCC. Do group leaders wish to notify the Council of any other changes in membership of committees? Thank you. Are members content to note and endorse the changes? Sorry, is that what you to speak? Are members happy to note these changes? Thank you. On outside bodies, members will see the councils being asked to represent the council on the Cambridgeshire Horizons Board. I understand that this is an appointment which is normally held by the leader of the council. Are there any nominations for this position? <coughs> I propose the leader to take that position. Thank you. Do we have a second? Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Are there any other nominations? In that case, thank you. We approve the leader to be our representative of the Cambridge Horizons Board. Are there any other changes that members, uh, in membership of outside bodies to report? Thank you. We come to item 10, questions from councillors. May I remind you that there is a period of 30 minutes available for these questions, and that includes questions where notice has been provided, as on the order papers, and if time remains, we shall deal with any question which has been submitted to officers at the prior to the start of this item, which I believe we do have to have. Uh, so, uh, we come to the questions. The first question, Councillor Ridley. Thank you. Uh, who's going to take the, uh, the answers of this order? Councillor Smith. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. The next item on your agenda is a question from Councillor Jeff Harvey. I understand he wishes to withdraw this question as the issue will be addressed via the developing climate change action plan. So we come to item C. Question from Councillor Peter Yeah, Chair, I have written on the old paper. Thank you. Who's going to take this one? Thank you, Chair. Um, the Zero Carbon Community Grant was approved by Cabinet in <coughs> May of this year, replacing the Community Energy Grant. The new scheme differs from the previous scheme in that it includes community engagement projects as well as uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. We wish to widen the scope of the grant and its ambition. Uh, up to £15,000 per project is made available through this present scheme compared to £3,000 previously. A total of £91,229 will be available through the scheme with an annual budget of £55,000 and in this year a, a, a further £36,229 which is rolled over from the previous scheme. The scheme was originally expected to open at the end of May. Chair, may I raise a point of order? Um, if you can recite the part of the proposition you think has been uh, uh, agreed with my government. Well, I'm very well certain. 11.7a, I believe, is the reference, but perhaps that more you have a look. Well, the point is that it's the responsibility for the dreadful answer. Indeed. So the question was how much money, and so I was expecting we spent this much or we spent this much, not an explanation or a justification for the scheme. And I believe that would be um, helpful. Would you like to continue? Yes, I was just getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 the problem is that the, um, the project officer who had, um, was running the scheme um, moved posts and so we have had to necessarily postpone the implementation of the, of the new scheme. But the new project officer, I'm happy to say, has been a recruited start to work last Monday. Um, grant applications will open at the end of July and awards made at some time in the autumn. Um, also, you, you uh, mentioned the Sustainable Parish Energy Partnership in your question. Um, all I would say is that support for that uh, continues as under the previous administration as part of the duties of the project officer in the Sustainable Communities team. Councillor Topham, do you have something? Yeah, well, I do, Chair, um, and I regret to say that my Supplementary is, I do not believe I have had an answer to the question. I have. That is not a supplementary question. Well, my supplementary question, Chair, in that case, is can the lead member please answer the question as asked? The answer is that to date, no amount has been awarded. That is true, and I've given the explanation for it. Um, I can't do it over, Chairman. I am content. I, I think I've explained the reason for it. Uh, unforeseen, uh, uncontrollable events. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chair. In the light of the uh, last my answer will be simply no. Thank you for the direct response. Um, given that many members have work and family commitments that make certain days impossible for them, will the administration consider a more varied approach to times, for example, not repeating something on the same day, or pro consider providing recordings of those briefings for members to access? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm very sorry that Councillor Williams will not attend the two member briefings that we had on the 4th of July. We did consider um, 
we in fact that salt will not make the morning session, or we felt that perhaps it will reach to do the evening session. Uh, as well, as far as your colleagues go, we will take that on that lesson. Thank you. Councillor Roy. That's right, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Um, thank you, Chair. The Housing Director approach in the recent national policy says that where uh, we just adopted a legal plan, that the Housing Committee is in effect until the 31st of October. So, yes, I'm using the public that we have, but the essence of it. Oh, let us go to Housing Committee. Uh, we are currently preparing a new trajectory and we will do public consultation in September, so we will go to Thank you. Do you have a supplementary question? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Could you give us some figures what the number that we need to deliver each year is and what we are delivering, please? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. No, as the current um, figure is still in effect in October. Uh, I believe it was 975, or perhaps we're back to you now. Uh, the new trajectory is based on the new planning guidelines that we have uh, received and work is already on, ongoing. So when we complete that work, I'll be able to give you the figures that we will be delivering going forward. Okay? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Chairman. Um, as written, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to be really brief in answering this one. Um, the Shareway Service plans are to purchase an additional refuge vehicle in the next financial year, and it's planned to have an electric waste collection with the operational finance side. Do you have something to Thank you, Chair, I do. Um, if we want to see and encourage drivers to convert to um, electric vehicles, we need to ensure that the uh, all new your new boats incorporate an electric vehicle charging point. Uh, can we be assured that this council will do everything possible to encourage developers through the planning system to ensure that an electric vehicle charging point is included in every new boat when it will cost, I believe, around £900, whereas post construction it will be in excess of £2,000. Thank you. May I remind them that your supplementary is supposed to arise from your original question or the reply. I'm not sure this one qualifies, but if you would like to respond, you are very welcome to. Um, perhaps a little bit uh, more painfully, but I would, uh, <laughs> I would anticipate that uh, we will do all we can to, uh, to meet the uh, end that you described. Thank you. That's the word. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, who's responding to this? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the Planning Commission for the hospital does contain um, traffic routing arrangements, which makes that we should come down to the boundary line now and then walk towards the hospital and hopefully not stand for a number of degrees. Um, however, we have been made aware that some of the issues should be constructing traffic uh, go through uh, some nearby villages. However, um, in the last two years, as far as we know from records, we have only received three complaints directly from residents. And for those, two of them, we couldn't even use the uh, information that was provided or the evidence that was provided. So, May I uh, ask you to let us know to give us the information directly as and when we do see the other issues? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as a surgery with the local council recently, almost all the residents' complaints were about HCVs, which they blame on North Stowe and the <coughs> A14. There were highways in them say HCVs. Willing and can't possibly be delivering or taking away from their activities. 
And I was down to the local councillor himself. He is fed up with the approach that the enforcement officers have taken. Um, what are the images want is enforcement? And how can our residents have any confidence in the promises made to, be, to them by way of conditions attached to their planning permissions when there are no sound and staff around to monitor compliance with these requirements? I just wonder, do you go back to the um, uh, your stone original people who put these stone plans in place? It's no good sitting there complaining, I don't think, because what we do for the AP team is go to the contractors and talk to them and have meetings with the contractors, and that's usually the best way of being done. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins? Uh, yeah, as I said, if we don't get the um, reports directly uh, to us, there's something we can do about it. Um, at the moment, what we're trying to do is organise a meeting together with site developers, uh, local members, and uh, parish councils. Meeting scheduled for 28th of August to go back through this traffic routine management plan that is in place here, and put in place um, potentially measures which include a logbook at the gates of every single site, so that every uh, lorry that comes in uh, has got time, date, registration number, content. Then we can have access to those logs if we receive complaints. The second thing that we'll be asking them to do is potentially install CCTV at the entrance of the sites. It will involve money and we will resist, um, especially if we ask for the CCTV to be remotely accessible to us, but it's not okay. But in the meantime, and I still say this, residents who see violations should report directly to the officers here. And what I'm planning to do is make sure that there is a dedicated email and hopefully a phone number that we can call. Thank you, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dr. Shadow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
as everybody knows it. Let me see the result.
this has hit a crisis where we see some of our school, we see full born going down to a, a four and a half day week and <laughs> classes being cut. So the, we have vastly different age groups being put together. Meanwhile, other parts of the school but, but it's have long since been cut to the bone. Teachers and parents and PTAs have been asked to step in to cover shortfall in maintenance and cleaning, both practically and in terms of budgets. How many stories have we all heard of teachers making purchases for their pupils? It's simply not right. Now, the government likes to trump it that our schools have never had so much money, that per pupil funding has increased. But, Chair, this is simply not the case. For many of our schools, cuts to lump sum funding are nowhere near covered by the increase in per pupil funding. And it simply ignores the real rises in costs to schools, some of which have been mandated by the government teacher pay and national insurance contributions, pension contributions, and the apprenticeship levy. And at the same time, we have deep cuts at the county council level that have had an impact on what the local authority can provide for special educational needs and school improvements. Chair, school funding is not a direct responsibility of this council, but this council, council does have a responsibility to stand up for the residents of this district on matters which affect them. And what could be more important than representing those represent residents that don't have a voice in the democratic process, the pupils of our schools? Just this week I received a newsletter from my son school. In it, parents were asked to lobby their district councillors as well as their MPs and county councillors on the issue of school funding. In the crisis we have now reached, it is everyone's responsibility to bring whatever authority we have to bear to lobby the government for change on this. So I hope that all members can back this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dobson. Do you have a second? Councillor Ripley. Councillor Ripley, you wish to speak. Yes, uh, Councillor Tom, will you speak to the I wholeheartedly support Councillor Dr. Toller's motion as thought to have reached a crisis point where the budgets have been cut to the bone and continue to be chipped away. Both secondary and primary schools are cornerstones of our communities and their health, financial situation, affects each community as a whole. Across this district and the country, cuts have had a devastating impact. Schools are more and more reliant on parental donations although already paid for through taxation, and through the efforts of PTAs to put on events. Clearly the capability of parents to do this will vary according to levels <coughs> of austerity in different communities. So those that are poorest tend to struggle the most. Many of us here in this chamber have probably attended and helped out at school fairs over the past few weeks. These used to be to raise funds for extras, now to support essentials. The danger is that we start to accept this and do adequate seating and toilets, books for the school library, playground equipment for infants so they can develop both in their physical and imaginative play as luxuries. Whereas we need to remind ourselves that these are essentials. I trained as a secondary school teacher just over 20 years ago, and over that time have unsurprisingly seen many changes. I decided to leave a few years ago for the good of my own mental and physical health. I felt I could no longer deliver the broad <coughs> and comprehensive education that each child deserves with the resources available, and one of those is time. I simply did not have time for my own three children and to support them as they navigate their way through school and life. I know I'm not alone in this. There is a recruitment and retention crisis in teaching. The most recent figures published on the 1st of July 2019 
from the DOE reveal that 40% of those leaving the profession are under age 35, and that almost a third of teachers leave within five years of qualifying a record high. The fashions are just too much. As alluded to earlier, I believe in a comprehensive education for all children from when they start to when they leave formal education. The model needs to remain inclusive and inspirational. An aspiration currently that many schools are finding more and more challenging. Due to the sources being tight, the focus is on the core subjects with very little left for more creative subjects, often areas where less academic pupils thrive. Okay, um, for special education needs and disabilities, schools have to find the six, first 6,000 with the county council talking at the remainder for each um, education healthcare plan. Nationally, there's one fifty billion shortfall in funding increases from central government since 2015. Um, okay, I'll, I'll summarise a bit more. So, I, I personally think this is a ticking time bomb. Okay, so I'm standing here in this council chamber today. I feel this is our responsibility to hold the government to account in this and fight for the future of our schools and communities. So I put this to this council to support this motion. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Well, uh, obviously I'm quite close to this because the Cornwall Primary School is a school in which it's had to decide to close the school on Wednesday afternoons uh, from the new school year, with considerable impact on parents and guardians and children in certain as well as obviously their education. It's interesting, the Local Government Association um, a few weeks back, back said that, um, to its knowledge, around about 250 primary schools in the country so far taken the decision to uh, reduce their uh, schooling hours because of the shortage of funds. I find it very disappointing that um, the MP for South East Hampshire, Lucy Fraser, um, actually um, doesn't appreciate the actual rising costs that her government has put the schools through. But not only is it a case of general inflation, they've also had to put up with increased pensions, uh, with increased salaries, um, they've also had to um, put up the appren apprenticeship tax, um, and also they have seen reduction in pupil premium because of the result of universal credit. Universal credit has had an impact on parents uh, applying for free school meals, which obviously then has an impact on the pupil premium, because pupil premium depends upon the number of pupils that have free school meals. So all these government policies have had an impact on school funds. And to say that schools have had an adequate funding, in fact school funding has been increased by, I think, 3.8%, is to show how out of touch the government is with the running of state schools. I find it incredible that here we are in this day and age that my local state primary school has reduced its hours to four and a half days a week, when an independent purse has five and a half days a week for its students, immediately putting students who go to state schools at a disadvantage to those whose parents can afford to send them to independent school. It's a disgraceful situation and the government should be ashamed of itself and I find it quite incredible that you know the party opposite has so far kept really silent on this crisis that's happening in our schools. Thank you. Uh, Council Kevin. And the chair and the Council has put an amendment down to the um, uh, Council Settlements um, motion. Has everybody had a copy of the sheet? Yeah, copy of the first and then we So, I'm going to the to and then I'm going to the to the
and my, you know, I don't want to see teachers have to make these sort of decisions that really, you know, are affecting children in, in our district. And, and I, I want the government to, to listen to um, the recommendations that are made in this uh, motion. And I've spoken to Councillor Council Solomon and um, tried to explain the, the amendments I made are small and they, they are to mild, mild the, the, the tone of this, this letter that will be written um, so, so as it it is it's accepted by, by government. I think, um, more broadly speaking, MPs in this area, from, from all different colours, or no colours at all, um, have um, worked really hard to try and push the government into um, providing more funding. And I think they, they do appreciate the, the difficulty that schools are having in this area. I know MPs recently Fraser had a meeting with head teachers in Westminster last week um, to, to follow up their concerns with, with the education minister. So I'm, I'm not trying to dilute this um, motion or, or letter that we said. In some ways, I think um, the amendment to, to take action during the next spending review strengthens it because I, I want to see action taken sooner rather than later. And um, I hope it's acceptable as a mild amendment to this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a second? Do you wish to speak now? Yes. Um, just to be clear, sir, this is a problem that we all face. Um, and unfortunately, my daughter is one of the statistics that gets quotes for those that need special, special support. So it is something that I think it does not matter what political party you are in this room, despite the comments that have been made, we all care about. This is to seek to strengthen it, it's also to seek to have more acceptance and to have more of a chance because this needs to happen. We need fair funding. We, we agree with that. We want to support, contrary to what was said. Sorry, you're speaking on the amendment. The amendment, sorry, the amendment would have more would have more chance if it, the language was calm and that's what we're seeking to do, but strengthening it on the time scale. Because otherwise it's danger that it won't get this Thank you. We are now discussing whether or not to accept this amendment. Um, I have noted several speakers down, but I'm not sure which they were uh, wishing to speak for, so we will start again. Are there people who wish to speak mm -hmm. to this amendment? Uh, thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just going through this uh, quickly, I think the point being made about the first, the first change means successive comments here, maybe, because they haven't struggled to fairly. They have not struggled, they have just decided not to come here. So, in my view, they struggle too, should be legal. That's my point. Uh, the next change, which says that, um, is the third long in that paragraph, uh, those issues uh, may lead to difficulties in retention, but it already has led to. Crisis in the teaching profession, which is confirmed by the next point that says the Department Council's professionals are going to judge the law. So I really don't see the point of that second set of changes. However, uh, the last one which is calling for them to take action with the next spending review. I think it's fair. Thank you. Um. Councillor Roberts, did you wish to speak to the amendment or to the... Because uh, at this moment in time, I'm not sure what I wanted to speak to. Councillor stand up and you'll tell me to sit down if I'm, you know, i <laughs> You are now speaking only However, to the However, I am going to get on to my... Councillor Roberts, you are speaking only as to whether we accept this amendment or not. Otherwise, um, wait until the amendment has been voted on, and then you can have your name to the glory. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. 
So I'm speaking to the amendment. <laughs> I'm not happy with the amendment. I'm not happy with the original. Um, I think the reason being, and this is speaking to the amendment, uh, which is basically supported, is all we're doing here is virtual signaling. We can't do anything about education. We can write as many letters to these people, and we can be either rude to them, or we can be less rude to them. It's not going to make an iota of difference. And I actually find, as a councillor of 30 years standing, it quite insulting for lots of new councillors to come here, try to put these sorts of motions that are absolutely... Not not to to the 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 okay, so in my opinion, you are virtue signaling, and really the amendment is no better than that as well, because it's going along with a, a principle that we shouldn't be going along with. Education is nothing to do with South Cambridge and District Council. I have five grandchildren, three of whom are in primary state education in Cambridgeshire. So I have got as much interest in the right, as the rest of you. Again, you are not speaking to the motion. If you only wish to speak to the motion, will you sit down there and call you later? I will not be voting for the motion. I think the motion should be thrown out. Thank you. Amendment. Councillor Delphine, do you wish to speak to the amendment or the motion? Uh, it's the motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Van Gogh. And the amendment. Thank you. I've got to hold this really uh, First, uh, I think the, the, uh, <laughs> the first uh, amendment, uh, I would be happy with this. It does, the, the problem isn't just about this government, it is a ongoing problem, it is undeniably significantly worse at the moment, so I wouldn't want to, to upload the blame. Uh, and, and the last amendment I think is actually very sensible. Um, uh, the spending, doing it through the spending review rather than one off paying one off um, uh, additional funding, I think would help, um, help the sustainability of any additional funding. Uh, but I'm afraid that I don't consider the, uh, uh, the second amendment. Uh, the difficulties are the, more than difficulties even now. It is a crisis now that we are addressing. Um, uh, and so I don't think we can, uh, I, I certainly won't be accepting this amendment from the project because of the second part of it. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Chairman. So, uh, just to begin, just to um, say that I acknowledge what Councillor Rivers was saying, uh, and we all have sympathy for uh, teachers and difficulties in schools. And nobody wants, wants to see you then. Yes, uh, nobody wants to argue for <coughs> lower funding for their schools. But I think the, the reason for this amendment is really to ask what is the purpose of this, of this motion? Is it, as it seems to be, to actually get higher funding for our schools, or is it a piece of political grandstanding? So the reason we put this motion uh, sorry, this, this amendment forward is really just to emotionally tone down some of the, the language. Now, one of the principles of asking somebody for money is that if you criticise them and if you call them a failure, you're less likely to get the money. So clearly... So you're talking about the yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm talking about... Um, talking about the yeah. use of words like failure and crisis. And things. If you want to raise extra money, and that's what we all want for our children, then we need to phrase our motion in such a way that it does not insult the government. Now, as, as other speakers mentioned, this is an issue that goes back uh, through many months. Uh, Conservatives have been in power since 2010, and as you all know, uh, that was in the coalition of Liberal Democrats for five of those nine years. So, so actually, it's as much your responsibility as, as ours. So, so really, it's not yeah. my responsibility at all. Do you remember you were addressing the chair? I apologise for using the chair. <laughs> so, the point is, if we really want to get extra funding for our schools, extra funding for our children's education, then the best way we can go about that is by phrasing our motion in such a way that it acknowledges uh, that many governments have uh, been responsible for the funding situation that we have. That one of the biggest problems we have is that because we're a rural area, we're not seen as being as important to the country as urban areas. And that 
if we want this money, we need to ask for it politely. Thank you.
members. Members, we have an agreed amendment agreed by the proposer, and therefore we no longer need to discuss this. Uh, the second paragraph now says, uh, believes that successive governments have not fairly funded schools, common, comma, which is jeopardizing the education, etc. In the other amendment, uh, the years of real term pay cuts for teachers, etc., have led to difficulties in retention and recruiting, and we keep take action during the next spending review. Is everyone clear what the motion is now? Yes. Thank you. We have one and a half minutes for further debate. And I have uh, councillors John Williams, Hunt, and Hart. Uh, if you only wish to say this is a jolly good idea, then I suggest that you waive your right to do so. If anyone has a particular detailed point, then I'm happy to allow you to. Councillor Hart. Well, it's point of order only, thanks. Uh, sorry. Um, the action uh, giving rise to the bullet points, does it, it needs a preposition at the end, so I think yeah. you ought to have to work that way. Yes, thank you. Point of action for next spending review two. two. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Um, what I was going to suggest was that um, instead of writing a letter which is going to disappear into an in tray in Whitehall, that we ask our cabinet to look at what they can do to help our primary and secondary schools. You know, we, we do have things in ways in which we can help them, but that would be really effective. Um, to have the council uh, looking at how we can help our school funding. Thank you. I'm afraid we are out of time. We cannot therefore discuss that. Uh, Councillor Dr. Solomon, uh, you have the right to speak now. If there is anything that you wish to say, otherwise we will go directly to the vote. Maybe just a couple of things, but I'll be very quick. Uh, just speak to uh, Councillor Rice. Um, Suggestion. Um, we've maybe seen quite a few uh, motions that have been kicked, cabinet. Um, so I'm glad that this one isn't one of them, but uh, maybe that is something that the cabinet will have heard to, to, to take up. Um, to speak to uh, the, the question of Councillor Roberts, um, I, I'm sorry to be referring to signaling. I know that there is a. I know that there isn't a direct responsibility. I'm, I feel, and I think many members of this council feel, that lending our weight to efforts to persuade people that do have responsibility for this, this situation is a worthwhile activity at this point. And so I, I hope that this council will have a Thank you very much. Since I know there is at least one member opposed to it, I think we should go to an electronic vote. So if you approve the motion, will you press the green button? If the motion has amended, thank you very much. The motion has amended, press the green button. If you wish to oppose it, the red button. If you wish to abstain, the yellow button. Has everybody voted? Will you see the result? Thank you. There are 37 in favour and one abstention. Thank you. The motion, therefore, is approved. We come now to the motion from Councillor Gavin Clayton. As this motion may have unqualified resource implications, I move that it be referred to the Cabinet for review and consideration in accordance with Standing Order 13 d Do I have a second? Thank you very much, Professor Hart. Councillor Hart, thank you very much. Does the Council agree with the decision of the very Cabinet? Thank you. 
The motion from Councillor Heather Williams has been withdrawn for further consideration. We come now to the motion from Councillor Mark Carroll, uh, item G. Article 15 of the Constitution provides that changes to the Constitution will only be approved by the full Council after consideration of the proposal by the Chief Executive. I therefore propose that this motion should be referred to the Constitutional Review Task and Finish Group for consideration as part of its general review of the Constitution and it will make recommendation to the Civil Affairs Committee and to Council. Do I have a second to that, please? Thank you very much indeed. Does the council agree to refer this to the Chatham uh, Village? Agree. Thank you. Item H. Uh, Councillor Chamberlain has informed me he wishes to defer this motion as we feel it needs more work to explore the potential implications and I'm grateful to him for his cooperation. Item I. Motion from Councillor Peter Toffey. Councillor Toffey, will you please propose the motion? Ooh. Thank you, Chair. Um, and may I use up a little bit of my time to congratulate Councillor Solon for passing your grammatical, legal, and metaphysical challenges in getting his, his motion accepted. So, a couple, of, um, a couple of meetings in the last few weeks have, have made me think and genuinely think quite seriously about. Uh, the local plan, and I was, I was actually, I very much enjoyed the all-member discussion about what, what are the aspirations for the local plan. Um, we were slightly distracted on my table because Councillor Wright and Councillor Cathcart had a, a sort of discussion about bananas and, and whether we should be importing bananas because apparently they uh, take away the soil uh, fertility in South America. But I think we were getting slightly off the point. The, the, the main discussion was you know, around what is it that this council wants from its local plan. And there was an early meeting that I attended, I think it was quite a few. And, and this was chaired by Councillor Hayes. And the discussion there was about carbon neutrality, carbon neutrality, sustainability. Um, and particularly the burdens that development place on uh, meeting the aspirations of the community. And I, again, you know, it seemed to me that there was an attempt by this council, and I, I give this administration credit, to, to try and shape a local plan that had some aspirations in it beyond where are we going to put the houses. So, it seems to me that at the same time, we have Great Cambridge Partnership uh, coming along suddenly and saying, well, we're going to put a large amount of concrete there, potentially a large amount of concrete there. Now, I'm not saying in this motion that that should never happen, that they need to be on so it should happen. But what I am saying is that as this council is investing considerable effort from us and our offices to shape the local plan, that we should be clear with the Greater Cambridge Partnership. I'm sure Councillor Andrew can make that clear. To be clear to that we will not entertain these propositions until and unless we have ourselves satisfied to our own expectations what sustainability means, what building means. And they will have to wait for their aspirations. Now, that is the long and the short of this motion, and therefore I invite Council to approve it. Thank you. Do you have a second? I do. Thank you, Councillor Jim. Do you wish to speak now or again? Uh, I'll speak at the end of my motion. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Dr. First. Thank you, yeah, so if you cast your minds back to last year, uh, the uh, Conservative group supported the motion for our district to become carbon neutral by 2050. And we're very pleased to see that the national government has followed this council's lead in um, making promise for the whole country to be carbon neutral. But I think we need to 
think amongst ourselves, yes, we all believe in sporting environment, but we have to uh, talk the talk, sorry, the walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And in my world, there is an enormous amount of uh, concern about parking rights uh, along the Naval 48, an enormous amount of concern about the guy that bus with Campbell. And we don't want to see the countryside built over and concrete built over. And I think now that we have, as a council, agreed to, to have this very, uh, very lofty goal of being carbon neutral by 2050, I think what we need to do is actually think very carefully about what that means and put in place, and, and you know, not to immediately jump up and start uh, putting car parks everywhere and uh, putting con concrete in the countryside. We need to actually think carefully about how it is that we're going to actually meet this time. So that's why I support um, Council Topic's motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would love to hear Councilor Weigel say that um, we need to think about how we're going to raise this zero carbon target that we're trying to meet. And that uh, people want to see the country side committed. I do recall some years back, during the creation of the last year, right? saying exactly the same thing. Why do you conservatives want to complete over the country side? And by the time you finish with the airport service corridor, it's the rule of the green. I do remember saying that. In this very chain. And yet, went ahead. Now, remember this. When you put the plan together, <coughs> the only transport solution for that corridor was a very much talented, high quality public transport, aka Camelot to Fairway Possible. Not direct, just a high quality public transport possible. Okay. However, what you're forgetting, I think, here is that this motion in some ways is seen to tie our next local plan, the work we're doing for that, to the work that is being done to deliver your local plan. You can't do that. That's all this. Can you just go on to the chair, please? Yes. So, we cannot tie the work of your local plan to the work that was done for the previous local plan to deliver it now, I think the proposal of this motion has forgotten that the uh, city bill was created to provide funding to deliver infrastructure because the government identified Greater Cambridge as a growth area. And that funding is meant to deliver infrastructure and that's what we have. So, trying to tie the hands of our representative at the GCP, I think it's a predetermination which we should really do. And I think we carry on this way, we'll be jeopardizing the delivery of the very plan that you put together. Therefore, I do not support the motion. Thank you, John. Uh, my observation is the same as uh, Councillor Hawkins has made, that you cannot tie the hands of any member in their decisions ever forthcoming uh, in their representation. Not only my representative of Hobson from Hobson, but I'm also the resident of Hobson. Um, I would be minded to support Council Tottenham's motion, except for the two elements that you mentioned. It is very important to me and my residents that any development that goes on in Hobson, that is park and ride, bypass, is linked to the environmental impact that that has to the residents of Hobson. I've been working with Councillor Peter Hailings to look at how we can get air quality monitoring put along the A10 so that that can be development on monitoring of the air quality and the impact of any future developments along the A10 to the air quality in the residence parcel. If a motion was put forward that said 
this council will work to develop things with air quality monitoring, then I would have to talk about hotspots and the needs a future level of plan and to give some determination to have to find a way. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dr. Sandberg. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, um, that's the direction. Uh, some technical problems with this. Uh, it, it, it seeks to predetermine uh, the uh, representatives of the, on the GCP, uh, which is impossible. Uh, it also um, seeks to undermine uh, the, um, the, consensus, the, the consensus that the GCP is built on, that is actually built into the Constitution that this Council, including um, uh, many members here, adopted uh, about five years ago. Um, so it is, uh, just, just in, in sort of uh, uh, legal terms, uh, unacceptable. Uh, but it is also, also uh, I wouldn't say explicitly, but uh, as the, the um, president's first member of the well, the effect of this motion would be to completely undermine the local plan um, and reverse back to the situation we were in a, a year ago uh, before we had our new local plan and having uh, no five year plan from that by no possibility of getting one. And in fact, enabling more concrete to go the countryside uh, than, than the, the, this, the current plan has. Um, uh, and and worse than that, uh, as, been, as been stated, what, what, what the Horston Park and Ride and what the uh, Cameron Kennedy Rustway are doing is dealing with the uh, providing the transport that uh, is needed for the current local plan. Uh, for the housing that is put out well beyond the green belt uh, that is to serve Cambridge. Uh, and to the development of the um, uh, Cambridge Environmental Campus, which is in the local plan, uh, but that over the, the last 20 years of development, uh, that the, uh, nobody has given it enough thought to how to get to there. And we're now getting to the uh, point of crisis where, as more businesses come to the Cambridge Environmental Campus, um, there is uh, almost no way of getting people there. Um, and the park and mind, which, to be frank, uh, is not just a, a um, we're addressing uh, now sort of the travel hub because it does have to be part of something more, part of a bigger plan, uh, a bigger strategy uh, to, to deal with these issues, to make Cambridge more sustainable in its transport, reduce congestion, uh, and uh, make public transport attractive, um, make actual uh, travel uh, attractive as well. Uh, taking these things in isolation is absurd because uh, the, 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 the GCP's uh, plan is, is for the whole of the Cambridge area, and that's the only way you can make uh, any real changes. Um, I think um, uh, this, this uh, motion should be should be rejected. Thank you. Thank um, you. It's not going to come as a surprise, Chairman, that I've interpreted it slightly different to how I've spoken. I, I see this as, as a pause until it does say so far as they relate to the transport, it's not asking for the next local plan to happen and be placed. Just the, the administration surely has their, their environmental concerns, we share them, and it seems, in my view, to make sense that such a big decision that's going to be made for such an area should take into consideration the environmental impacts. I, I don't think it's predetermination because there's nothing in here to say how our representative should or shouldn't feel about the proposal or give any opinion. It's just asking for a pause until we're really clear of the environmental situation. Um, and I feel perhaps more has been interpreted into it than perhaps than, than it actually is. And, and I do have faith in our representative of the GCP to negotiate the uh, predetermined issue as all of us do in these situations. And I'm sure you do the job well with this podcast. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Chair, would you like to have your answers? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't believe for one moment that this represents a predetermination. Um, I think the predetermination that we have heard was actually um, presented by the Deputy Leader, who has to all intents and purposes confirmed that there will be a 2,200 vehicle park and ride site at Harston. Um, I believe that if we are uh, to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, that a pause uh, should be taken whilst we fully understand how we need to drive this forward. Um, the deal to deliver infrastructure agreed that has been uh, set up by the, what was the city deal and been taken over by the 
Greater Cambridge Partnership has led to uh, a number of um, plans being put forward. Um, and I'm afraid that so far the uh, thoughts and uh, objections of residents have largely been, in my view, ignored. So I do believe that we really need to, to put our foot down and suggest to the Greater Cambridge Partnership that the residents of South Cambridge will be listened to. And with that, Chairman, I second the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I believe that there will be no more speakers. I don't know if you wish to speak. We will have a chance to close the debate. Chairman, I'd like to propose an amendment. Very well. Can we take that first, then, please? Yes, come on. Thank you, Chairman. I hope I've got too much time. Um, if, if this matter of predetermination of binding the uh, representative is, is a stopper to this, then I, I am entirely content to remove the first line of this, uh, this motion. I mean, you know, if someone had come to me in, in the last couple of days and said, look, you've got it wrong, but I would be open for that sort of discussion. But I'm, I'm very happy to say something along the lines of or specifically to say that until this council has completed and published its assessment of the environmental requirements and conditions of the next local plan, next local plan, so far as they may not transfer the options, the council is opposed to any further work on bringing forward proposals for a part of my arsenal of the eight years of age. And I believe, and I look from the lawyers who earn their trust, that that does not be determination.
So we're talking about a different body today to the body that was there 14, 15 months ago. And so I am therefore confident that GCP will not be delivering anything that is not built to high environmental standards, which is not going to uh, be something that will be um, accommodated within the, the new emerging local plan. But we cannot put a pause in place. The road networks are at capacity now. You know, this work should have actually happened already by now. It's been painfully slow. If we put a, a pause in place, we will grind to a complete halt. And the conversations I have with local employers, with businesses, is that if we make it any more difficult to get people linked from where they live to where they work, then those businesses will start making decisions to go elsewhere. And elsewhere will not be Huntingdonshire or Finland will be abroad. So we have to start delivering solutions now to support the current economy of South Cambridgeshire and Cambridge City. So we need to crack on with this and we need to trust our representative on GCP to make sure that all our, our environmental ambitions are taken into full consideration in any developments that happen as a result of the City Deal money. Thank you. I had had no further speakers, uh, but I had not noticed that the leaders' names would be done there. That's why I asked Councillor Chamberlain to wind, begin winding up the debate. I shall ask now Councillor Toppy to wind up the debate and we shall go to the vote. I apologise to those of you who were too late signalled your wish to vote. You should have done it Councillor Toppy. Thank you, Chair. I shall be very brief. I'm grateful for the support from Councillor Bygott. It's always it's always great to have support from an unexpected source, but it's, it's coherent. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Councillors, this is a matter of sovereignty. Which is the tail and which is the dog? Thank you. We shall now move to the vote. The motion is before you, unamended. If you wish to approve the motion, you will press the green button. I had looked at four speakers beforehand and I saw no hands until the debate about the amendment. And I'm sorry, Councillor Son. It's a factual question uh, on the point of information, yes, I will allow you to speak. Stand up and use your microphone, please. Um, there are no proposals for apartment over the castle. Uh, there's nothing there.
climate and ecological emergency. So in May, the first ever global scientific assessment of biodiversity and habitat loss showed unprecedented and dangerous decline of species and habitat. Over 40% in terms of insects and pollinators in Europe. Closer to home, we've heard the recently published habitat mapping by the Biodiversity Partnership Project. That showed us that in Cambridge and Peterborough, it confirmed that Cambridge and Peterborough is one of the poorest areas in the UK for biodiversity, tree cover and habitat. And that South Cambridgeshire has the lowest amount of area under management for nature. We are a growth area, we've said today, a growth area. Never before has it been more urgent that we balance economic growth with the enhancement and protection of nature. We are a growth area with unprecedented investment in our area, in South Cambridge. And at the same time, therefore, we need to make sure that we embed nature, conservation, protection within our planning system. Last week, we had a group from Hitler Lincoln, the Youth Eco Council, who came here, a group of between 8 and 11 year olds, to speak to our committee. And they shared their concerns and fears about climate change and about the environment. And they said decision makers here in the council, they think are not taking enough notice. They share their vision of a green district that lives in harmony between homes and businesses and the environment. We can, as a local authority and as a council, we can decide that through our planning system, which is ongoing at the moment, we do improve nature by embedding biodiversity net gain in development. And we can do that in the preparation of our next joint global plan. There are implications in this motion, and I have spoken to all senior planning policy officers who are involved in this, both here and the city and in the shared planning service. And they see them all as feasible, applicable, and things that they are working on. I therefore, Chair, ask this council that you support this motion as is. There is talk about doubling GBA in our area. Let's double nature at the same time. And let's allow nature to thrive as well as people and businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a second? So I'm obviously very happy to support this. We're leading the way in South Cambridgeshire and people are looking nationally at us. The fact that um, I've been given political leadership within the Oxford Cambridge Arc on the environment is a reflection of the faith that people from the top of the tree down to our humble level uh, have placed in us. You know, we have a real ambition to council here to roll out best practice and innovation. On Ops Canal, the new environment uh, working group's role is going to be to hold the other work streams, which are productivity, connectivity, and placemaking, hold them all to account, make sure that environmental <laughs> issues don't fall down the list of their priorities, that they're always at the top, and that we take every opportunity to grab innovation, best practice, all the new emerging ways of ensuring that we leave this, this world, leave South Cambridgeshire in a better condition than when we arrived here. For those of you of my age who were brought up during the Cold War, you will remember the cloud that the Cold War hung over us, how it was a threat that was always there. I remember my father talking about it in a bunker in our garden. To me, the threat from climate change is very similar to the threat that I felt during the during Cold War. This is something that could potentially destroy my world, destroy my children's world, and destroy your world as well. Something that has to be dealt with. And we have an enormous opportunity here in our home road, in the 
in district councils that actually lead the way, hold people to account, not to simulate to the motion from Councillor Solon about, you know, Education isn't our responsibility, but it doesn't mean because we don't have the money to deal with it, we should disregard it. We don't have all the tools at our hands to sort out climate change, but our voice will make, will make a difference. And that's why I'm very excited by what we're doing through our local plan, but actually it's not just about our local plan. What we are doing is being looked at by, by ministers, by senior civil servants. We have a real opportunity here to put South Hampshire for all political parties involved. We know this, this is not about, about political parties. This is about all of us in this room who care deeply about South Hampshire, care about all our residents who live here, care about the air quality that our young people and our old people are suffering as a result from. So, you know, there, there's, going to be lot, there's going to be lots more of this. You know, I am deeply grateful for the work that the Climate Environment Committee have done cross-party uh, committee, they are really leading, leading the way. And when I talk to other councils, they are picking up our example and setting up similar committees of their, their own. So I'm very happy to support this. I trust that there will be cross-council uh, support for this, because this is about doing the right thing and about us all making South Cambridge really the best place to live in because it will be green and it will be clean and the impact on our health and well-being and that of our children will benefit as a result and the burden on health and social care will be reduced consequently because it's all tick boxes as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we go into the may I ask if there is anyone who wishes to speak against this motion? Me. Thank you. In that case, we will probably debate, I was hoping we could just go straight to the vote <laughs> rather than all of us saying what a wonderful thing this is and wasting all our time. <laughs> Councillor Roberts, you have a point. Sorry, Chairman, Councillor Blige. Um, I'm just amazed because um, thinking of the, the last discussion that we had, the last motion, this seems to be um, completely contrary to what they were arguing, the Liberal Democrats were arguing for. I'm sorry to um, have to stand against uh, Bill because she's an excellent vice chairman of the planning committee, and I know that she is very knowledgeable about what she's written here, which she wasn't as long. I wish we could get it down to a few paragraphs if we're doing motions like we used to. However, I find that the Liberal Democrats claims and ambitions and visions which are plastered over most laws in this building nowadays, they don't seem to understand that all your dreams about a green and pleasant land with carbon and neutral and all this thing you did, it's going to be quite impossible while you keep churning out that you want to see the expansion, the growth the economic viability of Cambridge and Cambridgeshire. The two are not compliant with each other. The more that this city grows, the more that we allow it to grow and don't challenge the horrendous numbers of houses and businesses that we are told we must take, then you can forget all your dreams about your eco ecological um, glory, uh, flora and fauna, because at Hawkston or Harston or wherever it is that we've just been discussing, we're intending to lay green meadows, trees, hedges, get rid of all of them, let's put them all up, because the bloody car park must be built. We must have more parking for all these cars that will be required get all these extra people who we're encouraging to come in from everywhere, you know, <coughs> everywhere on the planet. So I can't understand what you, what your principles really are. Are I'm you going to right address the chair I and address the uh, motion yeah. under discussion? <laughs> the question is, are they green or are they actually hypocrites? Because you cannot be I'm sorry, Bridget, you and I have often have a lot of good time to, with each other and be with each other, but you know, I'm sorry, Bridget. 
Your dreams of Cambridge and what you're going to do are actually most residents' nightmares. There was a, a piece in the paper, Cambridge Evening News, the other day, where, where they've been doing some survey about the um, health, health safety of villages in Foxton. Your dreams of Cambridge and what you're going to do are actually most residents' nightmares. There was a piece in the paper, Cambridge Evening News, the other day, where they've been doing some survey about the um,
Um, I won't be hypocritical, I won't go for both one environmental issues and not the other. We <coughs> don't understand we are custodians, as has been said, for our children and grandchildren, because we're lucky enough to have them. Um, but we would like to see consistency, and this is not, this should not be a physical matter. If it wants to be taken seriously by the outside world, it should be seen as everybody on their own merits and should be advertised as so. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hunt. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, coming back to uh, Councillor Roberts and the half of clients. I just don't see the claim to democracy. I mean, we have here a desire to ensure there is a net biodiversity gate. We will try and keep personal remarks out of this debate. <laughs> I'm sorry, what's the comment you made? Um, okay. Uh, I don't recognise the conflict between building a car park. Our car park on the right, which has its own environmental goals in terms of reduction of carbon dioxide and other pollutants. With biodiversity, this scheme would give us the tools and the power to make sure that if we lose an acre of biodiversity land or have many acres of car park, it is recovered. So I do not see if there's any conflict there, and therefore I fully support this report. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thank you very much. I want to challenge the uh, idea that. Uh, Development and uh, biodiversity gains are incompatible. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that, and uh, the work that Councillor Haynes has done has been uh, really e excellent in this regard. And I'm very pleased to see that we've got cross chamber support in the, in the uh, main for this. In my local area, we have far away coming as a huge economic development, but we were actively involved with myself, other members, and parish council members to make sure that where they don't need their land, which is actually the, the development there is going to be a relatively small part of that, and the rest of the area, they are going to, they're going to make significant efforts to improve the biodiversity there. So that we will have a case example of a large economic development that is, is using the land that they're not occupying for their business in biodiversity gain. So we can do that. And we can send out a message to the world and our children that we did something to address the climate change issue. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Roberts, I will allow you to speak a second time on the motion. I thought, will you be quiet, please, until I have finished? I did four personal comments, and I am sorry they were made, but this is not the place to respond to them. If you wish to speak to the motion, you may now speak. So, I'm sorry, Chairman, it is absolutely the right place, and I will do. Uh, a comment was made about me, an allegation which is a lie was made about me, and I have to, and in a planning application, I have gone against, against an individual or a Roberts, this is not the I am going to say, I am going to say, no, I will not, Chairman. I will not, Chairman. It's been said that I was doing something wrong. I did not do a three villages against that particular application. It's not the application to go for the planning uh, approval. It is the land itself. There were three villages, Foxton, Palmyra and Trifler, that were all against it. We fought it. This council fought that application and appeal to refuse it. And her allegations are absolutely disgusting. She could be ashamed herself. She's not fit to be here. Councillor Hill Williams, if you wish to speak to the motion you may do, otherwise no. I was proposing a gentleman to the point of order to be clarified as to whether the breach of code conduct or not. We can take that up later, thank you. I have no further speakers, so uh, Councillor Hill Williams, would you like to close the debate? I'd just like to say thank you very much for making this really it's not easy, and we're just going to get through it. It will not be easy, but as Councillor Dawkins said, you need aspirations to come alongside. And as Councillor Smith said, the leader, we have to show in a combined voice, a joint voice, that there are aspirations of this vision, and the developers will come with us, and they will fight. But by putting double in nature, we're putting something that is tangible as an aspiration as a vision. 
there will not be willy nilly planting of anything. In the motion, together with officers, what is being done is a mapping to see where it's viable, why is it viable, and if you're going to place something, why and how. And that's the kind of mapping, the kind of evidence that we need to understand trade offs, to find balance in what every single time will be really difficult. And so thank you for supporting the thing. At least this is the aspiration, the vision we have, and we will aim to achieve it. Every single case will be difficult. But by having this in mind, and by approving this motion, we bring it up the planning hierarchy, which it has never been. And we put it there alongside the other objectives of the planning hierarchy. Thank you very much. Thank you, we move to the vote. If you approve this motion, you will press the green button. If you wish to oppose it, you press the red button. If you wish to abstain, you press the yellow uh, button. Has everybody voted? Then we see who's up. Those who have voted in favour of uh, one abstention, the motion is carried. Thank you. That concludes our consideration of motions, but may I urge members, please, if you wish to submit a motion, you consult with democratic services before you submit, so that we can solve the problems that prevented most of the motions being placed today. I, I did. I yes, did. My Thank you. We move to the Chairman's engagements. There are two engagements to report in addition to those printed on the agenda. On Monday the 27th of May, the Vice Chairman attended the Memorial Day 2019 at the Cambridge American Cemetery. On Wednesday the 26th of June, the Vice Chairman attended the Civic Open Day at RAF Molesworth, slash RAF Ordinary National Fusion Intelligence Centre, and those will be added to the, uh, uh, added to the minutes. Chair, um, most of these engagements are thought to me to be very pleasant. However, there is one that you have attended on behalf of this council, and that is the memorial service for uh, Michael Goldberg. And he was a good friend of this council, as well as obviously a good friend of the city. And Chair, I thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Subject to those additions and Councillor Dobby says, you are asked simply to note our uh, engagements. And we move to the exclusion of the press and public on page 9, Roman 9 of your agenda. Do members agree that the following item of business on the verbal pages contains exempt information falling within paragraphs 1?
Um, it would actually follow on from that resolution and the matter come back to the minutes to be approved that officers would therefore prepare these in paper. So we make that determination in the first instance based upon the resolution that was passed by Council the last time. Um, we are very, very strong in the view that, um, that that resolution should be passed because the information contained within the pink papers relates to an organisational review and consultation the results of which have not been published. Um, so it is our view that um, members should pass that resolution um, on the on the ground stated. I think I'm going to leave it there. Just I would remind members please not discuss the detail of the paper itself. Thank you. With that explanation, do people still want us to debate my statement? Yes. Do I have a second, please? Or my statement, as you see, no. too. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Dadwell. Uh, right, members, we will discuss this, but please, may I remind you, with no reference to the detail, Councillor uh, Dodd. Well, Chair, um, I've seen many organisational reviews. Um, I have been a few in the past, but that was a long time ago. So, um, it does seem to me that there is a discussion going on here about the organisation of the council. Um, I'm not aware of anything that would be sensitive to one particular person. And uh, therefore, I believe that the balance should uh, be in favour as the information of the person on the release of information rather than the potential. And therefore, I would like to uh, not exclude the press of the Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. I'm one of those people that thinks um, pink papers and keeping them confidential should actually be kept to a minimum. Uh, so, a little bit like the uh, British ambas Ambassador's emails about President Trump, and therefore then the following reaction from the Met, uh, which was well over the top, um, as they certainly were state secrets. Quite interesting, quite funny, uh, but not state secrets. Uh, again, like this, I, it seems to me to be the same situation here. Um, I think it's really quite important as well that um, as much information of how this organisation is run is actually available to the public and to staff as well. I, I really cannot see anything um, in um, this particular case that warrants it being kept um, as a close and confidential um, item. And I really would have to say, um, I, I think we've got to really avoid secrecy, whether that be closing meetings to the public or not allowing them access, because um, after all, it's so that we are representing, we are only their voice, we're not here instead of them. And I do believe that um, open government is good government, um, closed government at whatever level um, leads to people wondering how much more we keep secret uh, and, and what we are about uh, as organisations. So I would ask um, members to pay, carefully consider this. Is this really something that uh, requires it being kept confidential? If you, like me, feel it doesn't, then you know which way to go. Thank you. Thank you,